we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Desire for a car, desire for a woman or man, desire for position, desire for money, desire for enlightenment. All are on the same level. Hello and welcome to episode 210 of Urgency of Change. Each episode of the Krishnamurti podcast features carefully chosen extracts from the archives. The aim is to represent different aspects of Krishnamurti's radical approach to many of the issues and questions we all face in our lives. This week's theme is Desire. Upcoming themes are What is following, and thinking together. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust, based at Brockwood Park in Hampshire, UK. Brockwood is also home to Brockwood Park School, a unique international boarding school offering a personalised holistic education. It is deeply inspired by Krishnamurti's teaching, which encourages academic excellence, self-understanding, creativity and integrity. Please visit brockwood.org.uk for more information. You can also find our regular Krishnamurti quotes and videos on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review or rating on your podcast app. This helps our visibility. This week's episode on Desire has four sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's third talk in Bombay, 1979, titled, What is Desire? This has been one of the great problems of our life, desire. And why man has tried to suppress it, to control it, to give it full reign, Why has desire become so extraordinarily important? So we're going to go into this question. What is desire? Not the objects of desire, whether it be for a woman, for a man, for a car, or for God. They're all the same. The moment you have desire, the objects, God, car, woman, or a house, whatever it is, they are on the same level, because the desire is driving you. So we are inquiring into what is desire, the nature of desire. Desire exists when there is want, when there is lack. If there is, you lack food, then there is desire. You lack clothes, there is desire. When there is a want, there is a desire. This is so obvious. And Why does man not only psychologically want, but want something which is immeasurable, which is beyond all measure? So I'm going to ask first, 
if we may, what is the nature of desire? What is desire and will? Because most of our lives are dictated by action of the will. So will and desire are not separate. So we are going to inquire together into the nature and the movement of desire and whether will is part of desire and whether man can exist without will. All this is involved in this. What is desire? How does it arise? And why have religions, both Christian, Hindu, other, Buddhism and so on, have said that to serve God, not Buddhism, to serve God you must be, you must give over your desire. So we are asking, what is the nature and the movement of desire? Don't wait for me to answer. I am going to go into it, but you must also inquire with the speaker, otherwise you will merely hear words and that you have heard thousand years words. Sir, would you mind not taking notes? Because you cannot possibly take notes and pay attention. This is your life, not my life. So please be good enough to pay attention if you are interested. If you are not, then it is all right, too. Desire is sensation. The movement of the senses, which is to touch, taste, smell, See the sensations, the senses in action. Right? That is, you see, then there is contact, from contact there is sensation. And from the, in that sensation there exists also thought which creates the image for the object. Are you following all this? Just see it for yourself. First you see, perceive, then you touch, then in the very touching of it there is sensation, then the object is created by the mind with its image. I will explain this carefully. Please listen. You see a car, a nice, low, speedy car that doesn't exist in India. And the perception, the touching of it, the sensation and the thought that creates the image, you in the car, 
and driving it. And the enjoyment of driving it, the power, all that, that is the seeing, the touching, the sensation, then thought creating the image in the car. All that is the movement of desire. That's clear. Now, the problem arises when thought creates the image. Right, you are following this? Desire for enlightenment. That's why some of you are all dressed up like this. Desire for enlightenment. That is, one lives rather a shoddy life, ugly, conflicting life, and one wants something much greater. And those who have renounced the world, putting on a robe, are traditionally respected because they think they are nearer to that thing called enlightenment. It is still part of desire. So, desire for enlightenment, desire for a car, desire for a woman, desire to be, have a big position, desire to have money are on the same level, because they are born out of desire. One may call it noble, but it's still desire. So, our senses are very strong. And out of those senses, with their movement, with their reaction, is born desire. Right? This is clear. And why has man decried desire? You, you understand my question? Why have you suppressed desire, if you have? It's all right to have desire for money, that's highly respected. It is if you have desire when you are married for another woman, that is disreputable. It is highly regarded and respectable if, you are, if your desire urges you towards power, position, prestige. But they are all on the same level. There is no noble desire or ignoble desire. I know this will shock most of you, but look at it, examine it. And will is energy directed in a particular direction. Right? Will, with which one acts, is the energy operating, driving in a one direction, which is the same as desire. You are following all this? 
when you want to be a politician i hope you don't when you want to be a politician all your energy is directed in that direction which is the operation of your senses seeing uh, my thought seeing that if you achieved a certain political status you will be respected you will be feared you will do good to mankind and all that nonsense so desire and will go together and when we want happiness or enlightenment or a position a status that energy is being driven along a particular direction so that is the movement of desire from that desire arises the acceptance of authority who will tell you what to do because you feel you can't think so clearly as your guru or your leader or your boss so you accept that authority because it gives you comfort it gives you security it gives you sense of doing something which you think is right right this is all the nature of desire and the action of will we are not denying or s- suggesting that you suppress desire we are saying that you that one must understand the nature of desire when you comprehend something then you will deal with it intelligently but if you don't understand it then you battle against it you understand this naturally when you understand something you deal with it naturally the second extract is from the fifth talk in sanan 1979 titled is desire responsible for fear we have come to the point when you yourself observe the springing of desire right perception seeing contact sensation up to there there's no desire it's just a reaction you follow but the moment thought creates the image the whole cycle begins is this do you see this if you see it clearly then the question arises why does thought always creates this image you understand me why you see a shirt red blue white whatever it is instantly like and dislike which is the thought has its previous experiences liking and so on so can you observe the blue shirt dress in the window and realize the nature of thought and see that the moment when thought comes in the problem begins not only blue shirt or dress your sex 
your sexual experiences, the image, the pictures, the thinking over, or the image that you have of a position, a status, a function. You follow? So desire is that. So can you observe without the inflaming desire coming to be? You understand my question? Ex- go into it, you will see it, you can do it. That is the new instrument, which is to observe. Then <coughs> does thought, does desire for security for the same thing? Security in terms of big house, little house, bank account, which may be necessary, <coughs> and also security desire is created about oneself the image that you have about yourself and the fulfilment of that image in action. In that is involved many kinds of frustrations and in spite of the frustrations, in spite of conflicts, misery, desire pursues. Because thought is always creating the image where there is sensation involved. Right? I wonder if you see this. So, we are asking then, the next question is, is is desire responsible for fear? We have sought security through desire and the fulfilment of that desire in God, in what psychologically, I don't want to go on and on about this beastly stuff. And unconsciously, deeply, one may be aware that the thing in which you have invested, desire has invested, have no value at all. And having no value, then you are frightened. You understand? Are you following this? Because again, we are not analyzing fear. That's a stupid old game. We are observing the actual fact of fear and as it arises to observe, ask what is the root of it? Not analytically discover the root of it, but in the very observation of it you discover the root. You get it? Are you following all this? Huh? Are you? You seem rather doubtful. I'm going to go into this. Man has accepted and lived with fear, both outwardly and inwardly. Fear of violence, fear of physically getting hurt, and so on, outwardly. Psychologically, fear of not conforming to a pattern, fear of public opinion, 
fear of not achieving, not fulfilling, and so on, you know, psychologically. We are asking, which is a fact, can you observe that fact without the analytical mind operating on the fact and observe the whole movement of fear as it exists. You understand? Are you getting tired? Ten minutes more, bear up with it. Because, you see, it is possible to be absolutely psychologically be free of fear, absolutely. Don't accept my word for it. It's not my, it's a, your life is not mine, yours. You have to find this out. So you have to ask, what is fear? Has it has its roots in desire? Go into it slowly. Don't say no. Go into it. Desire being what we have said. Thought creating the image, and then pursuing that image, and might not might fulfill, might not. You follow? If it fulfills, there is no fear. Or at least there are other calamities involved in it. But <coughs> when there is no fulfillment, there is frustration. And the fear of not being able to fulfill. You understand? I mean, this whole complex sexual fulfilment, which they apparently the world is now just, just discovering it and making a lot of noise about it, promiscuous and all the rest of it. So we are asking, is fear the product of desire? Desire being the image formation and the fulfilment of that image in action. Right? Or is fear, please follow this carefully, part of time? Is fear the movement of time? So, has desire and time, uh, is desire and, and time, are desire and time responsible for fear? You understand? Oh, my Lord. Huh? I'll explain, I'll explain. Go slowly. Desire is the movement of thought with its ima imag imagery. That is the movement of thought creating the image and the movement of that image. Which is time. Right? No? Chronological, not chronological time, psychological time. And we are asking, is time responsible also for fear? The time of desire? Ah, I'm getting it. You get it? The time which desire creates and thought which has created the desire is and thought being also time, 
So thought and desire are responsible for fear. Huh? You see that? I am afraid what you might do to me. I am afraid you might hurt me psychologically. I might have. I am. I am afraid that dog will bite me. But the, at the moment of biting, <laughs> time has come to an end. You understand? It is only the dog might bite me. I have created the image, thought has created the image, that thought biting, which is time, in the future. Oh, you are following all this? So desire has its future, and time is naturally future, the past, present and future. So the question is, can thought realize its own movement creating fear? You understand? Thought realizing its own nature. When it realizes its own nature as the active principle in fear, what takes place? There is only then what is actually happening. I wonder if you see that. Do please come. Because it would be worthwhile if we could think together about this matter. Because then you would leave the tent without have, having understood the movement of fear and realizing the nature of desire and the nature of limited thought, creating time, which is fear. You understand? Do you realize it, or have you merely accepted the words? You understand? If you realize it, the thing is over. There are no gurus, no God, all that nonsense. No, no, thought, it's not a question of thought stopping. No, no, don't say thought. That We'll discuss that a little later when we talk about meditation, or if you are interested. But that's not the point. I am saying, does thought itself realize what it is doing? That it has created the desire, and the fulfilment of the desire is time. And in that is involved fear. And also, <coughs> thought has created what might happen. There's been pain. I hope you won't ha I won't, there won't be pain again, which is in the future. So thought has created the future, right? And the future is the very nature of fear. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's second talk in Ojai, 1979, titled Desire's Right Place. We have this extraordinary desire. It is 
energy which is driving, which is almost uncontrollable. I don't know if you have noticed all this. And we have never been able to give it its right place. So what is the please listen to it. What is the relationship between thought and desire? Do you understand my question? Where does Thought and desire meet. If thought does not meet desire, then what relationship is action without thought? You understand my question? Please, I'll have to go into. Please, be, have a little patience. Because we are investigating a very complex problem. You have a desire and you act. You see something in the shop, you desire and you buy or do something. What is the action of desire without thought? Is there an action of desire without thought? You are meeting all this. So I am asking, we are asking, what is the relationship between the two? You understand my question? Please understand my question first. That is, Desire is sensation, right? That is, you see something beautiful, there is perception, contact, sensation. If it is merely that, then it is very simple, isn't it? Seeing, contact, sensation. Hmm? When if it is merely if it ends there, there is no problem, right? I wonder if you understand this. Please, go into it with me. It is really important, this. You can see a beautiful vase, hmm? beautiful house, or beautiful woman, or man, whatever it is, beautiful thing. The seeing, the touching, there is the sensation. If it ends there, there is no problem. But when thought comes in and says, creates an image of having that vase, that person or whatever it is, in your house, in your, then begins the problem. You follow your. So I'm asking, what is the relationship between desire, which is Seeing, perception, contact, sensation, then thought taking that sensation over, creating an image, the vase in your house, the car in your garage, the man or the woman in your room, creating the image, and then the whole movement of struggle begins. I wonder if you get this clear. Are you following? Are you getting tired? 
So I'm asking, we are asking, what is the relationship between desire, thought, and action? Can there be perception, contact, sensation, without the interference of thought, which then creates the image and the pursuing of that image? You get this? I wonder if you get this. The pursuing of that image is your desire to fulfill. And not being able to feel fulfill, frustrated. Anger, jealousy, annoyance, bitterness, cynicism, the whole business of frustrated people. Because they cannot fulfill their desire. You are following all this? It's extraordinary how the mind, if you observe desire very closely, you can see this movement going on. So, desire is seeing, perception, contact, sensation, and can you stop there? And not let thought create the image and the pursuit of that image? And if it is, then fulfillment, frustration, and all the rest of it. We are asking now can, this, can thought, can perception, sens- contact, sensation stop? And no more. Which means thought has no relationship to desire, which creates the image and the pursuit of that image and the fulfillment, frustration, all that follows. Have you understood this? That demi- this demands a great deal of attention when there is this movement of desire, hmm, which is contraction, to be totally aware of all this at one glance. You, you understand what I'm saying? That is, when, you're, when there is clear insight into this, I'm using the word insight in the sense when you comprehend the whole of it, then desire and will play very little part in life. Then there's something else operates, which is intelligence. You understand? This perhaps a little bit, I'm introducing something else, which is Are you, may I go on with this, or are you, are you surfeit of this? Desire has not been properly investigated by people, specialists. We are not specialists, fortunately. We are ordinary people, laymen. We can investigate it without any losing any face or losing money, losing position or anything. We can just investigate and see the, op- the movement of this whole desire, which is perception, seeing, contact, sensation, thought taking the sensation over and creating the image, the image then pursuing that image, and the fulfilment of that in that image or the frustration when you when you understand when you look at this whole movement as a whole holistically there is an insight into it right you see the in, the inward working of it and which is intelligence so intelligence then operates not desire not mere sensation you got it? 
Have you understood something of this? That is, <coughs> our action is now based on desire, the image created by thought, acting. Therefore, your desire opposed to another desire. And so there is conflict between two desires. When you are married, husband, wife, girl, boy, this is the operation that's going on all the time. In every way, sexually, um, in ambition, this thing is going movement all your life, which brings great conflict, various forms of neurosis, and so on, so on, so on. So we are seeing something entirely different. To have an insight into the whole movement of desire. That is, to look at the whole desire, say, what shall I do without desire? Which sounds silly. If you take away desire, I can't act. We are not taking anything away. We are merely looking at the whole structure and the nature of desire. When you look at it completely, without any distortion, that very looking is intelligence. You understand? No? This is difficult. So what is intelligence? You say he's a very intelligent man. I don't mean that. You can be intelligent, but rather stupid too. The meaning of that word, according to the good dictionary, is to understand, to read between the lines, to be able to comprehend non-verbally, because that is what it means between the lines, to understand without gesture, without the word, to grasp the whole significance of something instantly. You, you understand? That is intelligence. Now, to grasp the whole significance of desire instantly and see the truth of it, and that intelligence then will operate, which, de- which doesn't mean that you deny desire. Intelligence is operating. Right? So are you? Now, (laughs) operating with intelligence or with desire, with its image and fulfilment. See the difference? When there is intelligence, desire has its place, and thought has its place. Therefore, there is no conflict. This requires a great deal of inquiry into oneself, to be so aware, so attentive to the arising of desire, contact, that's perception, contact, senses, arising, and then the thought instantly taking over, creating the image and the pursuing of that image. I must be the president. The whole business of it. When you understand this whole movement, have an insight, that very insight is intelligence, which then functions. Says intelligence then is operating, acting. Right? Have you captured some of it?
The final extract in this episode is from the fourth talk in Bombay, 1984, titled Meditation has nothing to do with desire. What is desire? What is the source of desire? How does the desire spring from? Is desire born from the object perceived? I see a beautiful car. The sea creates the desire, right? Just go. And please, careful, don't agree with what I'm saying. I'm going, we're going to contradict all that presently. So don't be caught in a trap. Does the object create desire? I see a beautiful house and I go. I see an extraordinarily intelligent, beautiful, depth of man head. I say, my God, I wish I had that. So we ought to inquire very carefully into what is desire. Not suppress desire. We are not saying suppress desire or give in to desire. Like the monks suppress desire. And the others indulge in desire. So we all together find out for ourselves, for ourselves, not be told. And the speaker is not telling you. For God's sake, he's not telling you. Find out what is desire. The object, a car, or a woman, or a beautiful tree, all that which you see in a lovely garden, the green lawn, the border of flowers, the scent of early morning, spring in the garden. You see all that. And you say, my God, I wish I had a garden like that. Don't you all want that kind of desire? Yes, sir. So, we are not suppressing or indulging. We are inquiring into what is desire. If I can, if one can understand the nature and the structure of desire, then you are, you can deal. You see the car. I'm taking that silly example. You can take your own particular example. You see something, a mechanic, a car, a good watch. Seeing that you visual, but seeing, then from that seeing, sensation, right? Right? From that sensation, what takes place? Contact is part of sensation, right? Then, just a minute, then what takes place? Don't repeat it. For, if you have heard this before from the speaker, don't repeat it. Because then that means nothing. Repetition is. I saw a parrot once. Beautiful parrot. Lovely tree. It was a chattering away what the master had been talking about. And that's what you generally do, repeat, repeat, repeat. So please don't repeat. Then you become second-hand human beings. 
with her dignity. So, seeing, contact, sensation. Now, what takes place after that? Go very slowly, find out. I see this very good watch a friend of gave. I see this in the window. I go inside, examine it, touch it, feel it, see the weight of it, who made it, and then what happens? Then thought comes in, creates an image. I would say, I wish I had it. That is, seeing, contact, sensation. Then thought immediately creates the image, right? And then that very second when thought creates the image of you in the car or you having that watch, at that second desire is born, right? Are we clear on this matter? <coughs> At least intellectually. Now, if you see that, can there be an interval between seeing, contact, sensation? An, an interval before thought? Takes shape, takes shape of it, makes a shape of it. You understand? You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? An interval. Can we do it? It's, it's all so rapid. So when you slow it down, like a motion picture, slow it down, then you see everything in detail. And that's desire. So extend the gap. Because you are desire. You are, you are the very structure of thought and desire. So if you understand, if you look into the nature of thought and your reactions, you can slow the whole mechanism down very quiet, slowly. Or you understand this instantly. That requires attention, that requires passion to find out. So, let's go back to meditation. That is, if you have understood, not verbally, if you understand the nature and the structure of desire, then we can go back and find out what is meditation. Is conscious meditation meditation? You understand my question? Is it? Obviously not. If I consciously sit down for 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, 20 minutes in the evening, then it becomes a a relaxation, siesta, <coughs> nice, comfortable, enjoyable, go to bed. That's what it's called. I won't name it, you know all that business. So what is meditation? If you consciously meditate, it has a, a direction, a motive, a, a desire to achieve. 
Actually, that's not meditation, is it? That's like becoming the clock becoming a manager. He's working, working, working. The two things are the same. They're not, you call that business, the other call it religious achievement. Both are exactly the same thing. Do we see that? Gentlemen, do you see it? Who meditate? Of course not. That means giving up your pet enjoyment, pet entertainment. So we are saying conscious meditation is no meditation. Because it's born of desire. Therefore, it's born out of a desire to achieve, to become something. What is it? Becoming the self becoming something. The self, the me becoming God. So it sounds so safe. Forgive me for using that word. Then what is meditation? If it is not conscious meditation, then what is meditation? You understand? The word meditation means also to meditate, to ponder, to think over, and also measure, to measure. That's part of the meaning of root meaning of the word meditation, both in Sanskrit and so on. Now, can your brain stop measuring? You say, I am this, I will be that. I am comparing myself with you. You are so beautiful, so you have grace, you have brains, you have got quality, depth, you are aesthetically living something extraordinary. I want that. You are measuring, which is comparison. Right? Can you stop comparing? Don't agree, stop, compare and find out what it means to live without a movement of comparison. So you understand? Love is not a reaction. Therefore it's free. Not to express what you want. That's a reaction. And free is part of that love. Where there is love, there is intelligence. Not born of out of thought. Intelligence is something outside the brain. I won't go into any stupid coffee, I'm just going to. Like compassion, compassion, love, freedom is outside the brain. I know. I could go into there is no time. Because the brain is conditioned, it can't contain this. So, meditation is not. Conscious, deliberate act. This is a totally different kind of meditation, which has nothing whatsoever to do with thought and desire. And that means a brain that is really, if I may use the word, empty. Empty of all the things that thought man has made. And where there is 
space, because this freedom means that, love means space, vast, limitless space. And where there is space, there is silence and energy. If you are, if you are brave, if you are thinking about yourself all day long, which most of us are, then you have reduced the extraordinary capacity of the brain to a, such a small issue about yourself. Therefore you have no space. And so the brain, the brain, though it has its own rhythm, not the speaker is a specialist on brain, but he has lived a long time, studied a long time himself, watched others. Brain has its own rhythm that can be left alone. But when the brain is silent, not chattering, quiet, utterly, then there is that which is not measurable by words, that which is eternal, nameless. 